Hello, this is Bad Bob the Astronomer. I'm, uh, I'm just, um, what happened was uh, I put several videos <clears throat> on YouTube <clears throat> a few months ago um, uh, describing how I built my uh, Gregorian, my 20 inch Gregorian telescope. And one of the people that watched those videos um, wanted to convert his 13.1 uh, inch Newtonian reflector into a Gregorian telescope. So uh, he also owns a uh, four inch F4 Newtonian reflector and he wants to use the 13.1 inch primary F4.5 mirror in conjunction with the smaller four inch mirror to form a Gregorian telescope. So what I'm going to do is just sort of give you an idea of how that can be accomplished. Right now um, uh, I'll show you the optical layout. These uh, arrows right here, uh, oh, these long lines, uh, show uh, a bundle of parallel light rays coming in from a star. For all practical purposes for optical design, light can be thought of that way in this particular case. So the light waves co come down here like this into the telescope tube. This is the 13 inch primary mirror right here and then that's a concave mirror and the light rays bounce off of that as you can see from the arrows and they intersect right at the point A right there. Now what that point is that's the focus of the Newtonian reflector. What would happen is in the Newtonian is there would be a, a small elliptical flat mirror diagonal right here like this and it would bounce the light from the primary out into a focal position right there and you'd use a telescope eyepiece and the uh, and right there and move it up and down with a rapid pinion focuser of some kind and then you'd have your eye behind it to focus on the star and what that a point is is that's where the light rays all converge into one tiny little point that's a real image of the star if you put a photographic film there of some kind you'd get a tiny little white dot appearing on the photographic film and that would be the image of the star. So what happens is you don't put anything there in the Gregorian. Just leave everything alone. It's just empty airspace. And the light rays proceed beyond point A and they strike the Gregorian secondary mirror right here which is also a concave mirror. <clears throat> in this case it's a 4 inch F4 mirror. It's actually a paraboloid. Okay now as far as I know um, the person that one the information has a fairly accurately polished 13 inch paraboloid for the primary mirror and a fairly accurate 4 inch paraboloid for the Gregorian secondary and normally you're supposed to have an ellipsoid as the surface shape of the Gregorian secondary but in this particular case like with the 4 inch mirror not being very large the difference between the paraboloid and the ellipsoid is very small. It's probably well under a wavelength of light, probably less than a quarter wavelength of light. In that case, <clears throat> the paraboloid is going to give you a reasonably sharp image of the star at the final focus, as far as I could tell, assuming that the optical manufacturers made the mirrors accurate in the first place. Okay, what happens is this Gregorian secondary mirror sends the light rays in a long narrow cone back as you can see these arrows right here and then they intersect a flat mirror, a small flat mirror similar to an Newtonian diagonal right there back very close to the primary mirror I would say five or six inches in front of the primary mirror and that reflects the light the cone of light out to the side of the tube similar to a Newtonian reflector and to the point C, and that's the final focal point right there is C. And then there's an eyepiece D, and then the eye is right here looking through the eyepiece. And the way you focus the lens, of course, the eyepiece is just regularly <clears throat> with a rack and pinion a focuser of some kind. And that will um, allow you to move this eyepiece up and down a little bit until you attain a, a very sharp image of that star at C through the eyepiece. It'll look like a little point of light, just like it when you see the star in the sky, only a lot brighter. Okay, now, <clears throat> the thing is, <clears throat> uh, where are these mirrors placed? Okay, you see a little dot there, B. Okay, that little dot B uh, is actually 
where uh, the actual focus of the F4 secondary mirror if it were in a normal Newtonian reflector. Okay, so that would be an F4 mirror. So B is approximately 16 inches away from the surface of the 4-inch mirror. So the distance between A and B is a little difficult to determine accurately. It requires, uh, I tried to do it with my Gregorian, and I, I ended up using a quadratic equation. That's what I derived. And I had all kinds of a very complicated uh, uh, algebra, algebra in it. And it turned out that when I solved the quadratic equation, I got two imaginary numbers. So instead of that, what I would recommend is the distance between A and B is, for this purpose, is approximately three inches. Okay, so the total distance, I've got it written down, between this mirror and the surface of that one is approximately 78 inches. Okay, now what you have to do is mount this mirror on some kind of a device that will allow it to shift back and forth in very small amounts, this way and that way, so you can get the point C exactly where you want it to be. Okay, because if you shift this mirror by about a sixteenth of an inch forward, it will shift point C by a full inch forward, approximately. It's very sensitive to the position. Also, it's very sensitive to tilt this way, like being tilted like that. So what you have to do is mount this mirror so that's not being pinched. Uh, by the way, the, the gentleman that wanted the information owns a copy of Texrow's book, Jan Texrow's book, How to Make a Telescope. So it tells how to mount secondary mirrors for Cassegradians, and you'd have to mount this in a somewhat similar way, so that this was not under any stress, it would maybe rattle by about a hundredth of an inch, and you don't want a large cell that sticks way out to the side because it'll block too much of the incoming starlight. You don't want that. But you have to have this mirror allowed to tilt this way a little bit in small amounts and also maybe mount the whole thing on a threaded rod say a half inch piece of threaded rod or something like that that will allow you to shift that back and forth a bit so that you can by um, uh, just by trial and error find out where that point C is in relation to where you want it to be like like pick an eyepiece get an eyepiece holder attached and uh, pick a point where you want C to be that's comfortable for all your eyepieces and then shift this back and forth and maybe focus on a distant um, say street light or uh, or um, uh, some kind of object like uh, like a tree or something approximately a mile away and that will approximate infinity and then you could set it all up and move that back and forth and get this to f achieve final accurate sharp focus Okay, and you also, Textro gives directions on how to tilt this mirror correctly and tilt the primary mirror correctly so that these mirrors will be absolutely square on, like to this direction, which is the optical axis. And when you, it's actually pretty easy to do. When you do that, then everything will be all lined up. And you also have to align this small elliptical flat mirror up so that when you look through this eyepiece focus without an eyepiece in it, you'll see this of the elliptical shape which will look circular then of this flat mirror centered in the eyepiece and then you'll have to tilt this mirror so that this mirror will be centered in that mirror when you just look through without an eyepiece in. So it sounds complicated and actually it's not that easy to do in a way but once you get used to it it's not that hard. It's not not as difficult as you'd think. Okay now let's see where am I going with this. <clears throat> um, uh, Actually, that's basically the way you do it. Uh, now, oh yes, I wanted to discuss the equivalent focal length. I just this is, these are all approximate calculations because when a manufacturer makes a telescope like a Newtonian, he usually doesn't give you the exact the exact um, focal length of the mirror. It's usually out you know, by half an inch or something like that, from what he states. And the same with this one. So um, I'm giving you an approximate idea of what the equivalent focal length of this telescope is. So the amplifying factor is the ratio, you add up the distance between C and the mirror plus the distance between the mirror and this mirror and that's uh, that would be about 59 inches according to just a rough estimate and the distance between A and the surface of that mirror is approximately 19 inches Okay, so that, that distance right here from that mirror to that point right there, 
traversing the, the optical path is approximately 78 inches. Okay, now I figured out that the ratio of the distance between A and the mirror and that long length that I just mentioned, the ratio is approximately 4.47. Okay, so that means that that distance is 4.47 times what the distance between A and the mirror is. That's the amplifying factor of the Gregorian telescope. And what that means is that the final focal ratio is 4.5, which is the ratio of the primary mirror, multiplied by 4.47, and that equals approximately 20. It's actually 20.1. But anyway, I'll assume it's about 20. So that means when you look with this eyepiece here, you're looking at the equivalent focal length of 20 times 13.1, equals approximately 264 inches. So that means if you put a one inch focal length eyepiece right there, you're going to get 264 power. That's one big advantage of the Gregorian telescope, okay, is it gives you a lot of magnification. Now I see I'm running a little low on time, so what I'm saying is, I want to say briefly is, that this is a lot of work to make this thing well, to make it work well, and you'd get the equivalent magnification of just using a high power eyepiece if you had, say, the Newtonian focus here instead. So, uh, the, one of the, so actually, if you just want something simple, like a lot of amateurs probably are quite correct in wanting a telescope that's simple and easy to use and uh, works well, is not going to be diff problem difficulties, and um, all you'd have to do with a simple Newtonian is to put in a higher power eyepiece and you'd get the same view as you would with a Gregorian with a longer focal length eyepiece. And you could also use a Barlow lens to um, make, to, it works very similar to this optically. It makes the light cone long and narrow. And it would, a typical Barlow will make your magnification three times higher than it normally would be with the same eyepiece. So you could get by quite nicely with the Newtonian. Another problem with this design right here is that you can't achieve a wide angle field of view in the sky which makes this thing very hard to, very difficult to aim at any specific object so um, it will make it harder for you to follow an object across the sky as the earth rotates so in order to make this telescope really viable you would almost have to have an equatorial mount with a clock drive or some kind of a motor mechanism to at least make it follow the object fairly well for say 20 minutes you can't get by with a simple Dobsonian that you could just nudge by hand Okay, with well, the beauty of a simple Dobsonian is you can put in a low power eyepiece which has a wide angle field of view, locate your object fairly easily, and then you could track it. If you lose it with a high power, you take the high power eyepiece out, put the low power eyepiece in and locate it again, and then put the high power back in. But this one you can't do that. So you're stuck with a high power. Okay, that's one problem with this. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit longer than the... Uh, than the limit I might on the 15 minute limit uh, for YouTube so you may find a second uh, video for me finishing this off but I think I've said just about everything I need to say right now so if all of a sudden it chops off uh, cuts off don't worry about it it just uh, I might not put the second one in after all I think I've said just about everything I need to say um, uh, you have to mount these mirrors very carefully, just as I was mentioning, so that there's no flexure in them. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Right now, there's still time. This mirror will need its own separate spider support, and so will this one, right here, will need its own separate spider support. You'll know what that means when you look at the book. It's a mirror way of supporting the uh, mirrors in front of the main mirror. And it's a good idea to have this at least a little bit, like five or six inches away from the primary, so that when you're inserting the spider in that and fiddling around with it, you won't accidentally bump your hand or a tool or something into the surface of this mirror. You want to have a little gap just for safety. And um, also, um, uh, let's see, what else was I going to say? Uh, you'll have to have, of course, the tube extension because this is going to stick out a lot way farther, the Newtonian diagonal would be right here. So this is going to make the tube a lot longer. Another thing that you'll have to think about is that um, what happens is with a...